Well, good morning. Um, and morning. thank you very much for joining me, uh, Mark Long and Tamara Freke, uh, to have this discussion uh, in um, line with Neurodiversity Pride Day and our upcoming Neuroemergence Conference about rebranding dyslexia. Uh, Mark Long is a, oh God, I should be better prepared for this. <laughs> Mark Long is a communication and creative strategies and a TEDx speaker, and he is founder of the I Am Lex platform. Would you tell us a little bit more about that, Mark? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, I, I went on TEDx to basically officially come out, um, to uh, come out of my shell, essentially, with my dyslexia professionally on LinkedIn. You know, there's a lot of advocacy around this, um, you know, especially with what Richard Branson's doing and I and uh, LinkedIn including it as a skill set. So I've been trying to embrace that um, as you know nerve-wracking as it is to say it professionally on your resume or during interviews. Um, so yeah, basically coming on TEDx saying, hey, I think this is there's a time to change the narrative to focus on the adults with dyslexia and, and that it can be a skill and it can be something that can be progressive or helpful for a business. Um, and so the development and, and creation of, um, you know, reducing and, and condensing down the idea of dyslexia to something more modern or, or opening up a new identity or communication can help people to um, get rid of these old stereotypes based on outdated research and look at a modern take of, of what dyslexic thinking can do to a team and to a business. Wonderful. Thank you. And Tamara is also with us. She's a children's coach fo focusing on self-confidence and one of the co-founders of the Hoy Foundation here in the Netherlands. Would you tell us a little bit more about that as well, Tamara? Sure. Yeah. So um, as a dyslexic of 51, um, in my youth, uh, I was lazy and dumb <laughs> in school. I didn't understand and I didn't understand that my mother thought, hmm, I, I don't see this lazy and dumb child at, at home. So what's going on? And so she started to research and in America, they were much further ahead and, and she figured out, ah, it's something that's called uh, word blindness. And so then my father thought, ah, that's me too. <laughs> and my father and 50% of the family. So later I got three kids. I scored 100%. So all my kids are dyslexic. And, and I thought, well, it's 30 years later. Um, they're going to be fine at school because everybody knows about dyslexia. And so they started and went, um, you know, below zero in, in self-confidence. And I thought, no, 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 I'm not going to let my kids go through school broken as I was and my brother. Uh, I have to do something. I have to figure out how to give them um, a self-worth feeling. And so I bumped into Stephanie Raber, who had lots of uh, knowledge on, on neurodiversity and all the new scientific uh, uh, view on dyslexia. And I thought, my God, if we are telling the whole story of dyslexia, and not just what we're not very good at, but also to focus on what we're good at and that we are worthwhile, then these kids are so differently uh, going through school with so much more self-esteem. And uh, and so this is why uh, Stephanie and I started Toy Foundation to rebrand dyslexia, to tell the whole story and focus also on what we are good at. So, um, and in the meantime, I started to uh, uh, coach these kids and uh, got an education on that. And, and it's magic to see them grow. I remember reading uh, the Dyslexic Advantage for the first time, and it was such an eye-opener for me. I was not, specifically targeted as dyslexic but i th and i think my coping mechanism was actually reading but i have dyslexia running all through my family my father-in-law is dyslexic my sister is terribly dyslexic so is her eldest daughter and uh, my youngest daughter as well so and i see so many upsides as well like they're all such creative thinkers uh super like visual always very acute like if I'm looking for anything in the house or outside. I'll ask my youngest daughter and she'll spot it immediately. She has such 
a great uh, uh, visual sense and attention. She sees everything. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I would like, since our topic for uh, this neuroemergence is also owning your stories, I would like to go a little bit deeper into your personal journey with dyslexia. Would you maybe like to start, Mark? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, when I was six years old, I was growing up in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, you know, it was kindergarten, essentially, or first grade, rather. Um, I just started to really disconnect socially with uh, the kids around me. I wouldn't be doing my homework. I would be failing all the spelling tests. And I remember there was this uh, first feeling of stress and anxiety, even though, you know, being six years old, seven years old, um, and the teacher wanted to hold, uh, hold me back uh, a grade. So I, I repeat first grade. Um, at that time, my mom decided to homeschool me because she thought, you know, her sister was homeschooling and maybe that would have them have a better control or understanding or, or guidance with um, just to figure out what was going on. So there was a lot of testing uh, at Berkeley University in California. And so, the, you know, at the, at the time, this was the 90s, so, or like late 90s. So um, it was a lot of focus on vision. So I was doing a lot of vision tests. You know, it was just a bunch of young students just hooking me up with machines and just making me do crazy stuff with my eyes. And I hated it. It was horrible. It was so traumatic. It was really terrible. Um, but... Uh, but they realized, okay, yeah, he has dyslexia and, and, um, officially diagnosed with that later, I realized, um, that I also have dysgraphia, dyscalculia, um, and, you know, it's, it's always a cocktail when it comes to neurodiversity. So we, we all have, we have things that we haven't discovered and we're discovering them. I'm discovering a lot going through this process. Um, and so it was from that time I was going to tons of resource classes, even at the school that I was not going to anymore. So my friends that were there, I would have to go to a special class, only that special class. And they're kind of like, why aren't you in the playground? And why aren't you here? So it was like, okay, from that point, I wanted to hide. And I just hit it, denied it, um, got through it. School has been amazing in terms of the support, but the uh, ridicule. I feel like every time there's a resource class or special education class, it's in a very inconvenient place. Either it's like way outside or it's in, somewhere near um, populated areas. I mean, it always is going to be not in the right right place for, for neurodivergence. Um, but the, the bullying and all of that, I mean, I, I didn't personally receive a lot because I, I adapted. I learned to, you know, befriend with the right people and I'm a social person, so it wasn't too difficult, but I just didn't feel like I belonged there. And but I needed it because if when I stopped going, I would fail and I would I would just do terribly. And I didn't want to I didn't want to prolong my time in school at all. It was like I need to get <laughs> done, whatever it is, even if I'm getting C's, um, that's enough. Uh <laughs> But I, but I'm I'm trying for A's, but I'm getting C's. So that's just my brain. That's just how it works. And uh, I graduated, and then the real world comes, where there are no supports. You know, there are no resource classes, even if they were available um, for for an adult and for, and for pursuing your career. And I didn't want to. I still wanted to hide, and I still wanted to discover and find myself. But I just delved into what I loved most, which is creativity, storytelling, advertising. Um, you know, I watched the Super Bowl, not for the for the football game, but for the commercials. I loved commercials. And mm -hmm. I was filming on my mom's old VHS camcorder all the time and making my own videos, music videos, everything. It was just, it was an obsession. She also was walking around with this VHS influencing me, you know, filming everything. We have millions of home videos. So it was a real like beginnings of creating content, essentially. You know, I was already creating content before content was something. Um, and being in the advertising world, it's cutthroat. It's really challenging and hard. And they're going to be blunt and they're going to be mean. 
Um, so I developed really thick skin, but the biggest regret I have is the moments that I could have been honest about my dyslexia. Um, and I wasn't, and I, and I, and I refused to face it and I hid it. And I got to the point where I have two kids, you know, I'm 37 years old. It's time to be honest and, and self-reflect and open up. But what I saw around me when it came to dyslexia awareness, it just was ugly to my, you know, for, as a creative, it just wasn't creative. And if dyslexia is considered one of the most creative disabilities, I would say, neuro, neuro, neurodiversity, um, being one of the creative spectrums, why doesn't that reflect? Why is it 2023 and all these brands and all these people are doing amazingly innovative, cool stuff for nothing? No purpose, really. Sure. Some, a lot for just, you know, the opposite of, of pro progress. Why is neurodiversity not talked about? Why is it not innovative? Why is it not cool? Um, and I thought, okay, what's the problem? The word is the problem. You know, the, the problem is that everybody thinks they know what dyslexia is and we can't even spell dyslexia. And, <laughs> and this is where I was like, okay, I can't even spell my own disability. That's crazy. And as a creative, what I do for clients, what I do for brands, I thought, why can't I do that to dyslexia? Why can't I take it? And it's like a brief for me. So it was like, okay, I'm just going to put my process, my storytelling process into finding this golden fish, this way to change things up, to change the narrative for the hope to educate the future people, the future leaders, the people who get resumes on their on you know and their email and they read it and they see misspellings and they say whoa this could be actually a dyslexic person like a real creative mind that people yeah. are just passing by yeah this could be somebody that actually will do something and can contribute to something and so that has just been my narrative is like i don't care how scared i am to be open about it but i the at least at the least, I plant a seed in someone's mind that doesn't know or will rethink it and, and they will come across it again. And I hope that that, that influence will make them more open-minded to the possibility. You know, I mean, you turn, yeah. on the light, you turn on the light bulb, you take out your phone. Those are created by dyslexic inventors, you know, everything around you. So... So we'll come back to the rebranding, but I just want to take you slightly back uh, around your story. So when did you first start to connect those upsides of being so creative, being a storyteller? When did you first start to connect those upsides to your dyslexia? Well, you know, that's, that is a, that is a good question because it has not, um, it, it's still, I'm still figuring this out. And I get the questions now during interviews, they say, I actually just the other day, um, he, I was not really being open about it because, you know, I'm always hesitant. Like, should I open about it? And he said, you know, I see that you have dyslexia on your profile. What does that do for you? How does that affect you? How does that contribute? Um, and I think that when I, when I read that dyslexics are known to kind of think three dimensionally, you know, this, this gets thrown around a lot. But it's really hard to explain that, how like how that actually is. And I think that has been when I read that and when I thought about my process, how I'm really looking at each project, how I will be able to see like a bigger picture. Sure, the small little components, like when I have to write a post, that's so difficult. But like to understand how it holistically works and how it progresses. I mean, you know, this this definitely happened. Um, after school when I started realizing this, but I think that was been one of the most, the biggest connections. So, so being able to see how a bigger picture fits together and how it all connects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Samara, how about you? Tell me a little bit more about your story. Uh, well, I was saying um, before, like in my time, I, I, you know, I went to school in the beginning of the six, uh, 70s, so it was a different time in Holland. I didn't know about dyslexia or hardly know anything about dyslexia. Um, so 
you know, you're stupid and dumb and you don't do enough uh, work and, and, and don't put enough effort in it. And I started to believe that. Although my mom was, no, 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 that's not true. And there's something else going on. I, you know, you start to believe it. And I always try to explain it. Like I feel this attic in my head, this, this, but I don't know where the stairs are. Like, you know, I, I can't reach it. I know I am kind of capable, but I don't know how to find it. And uh, so I felt mis misplaced like Mark and, um, uh, I was a very introvert child, a very scared child. Um, and now if you know me, I'm extrovert. <laughs> I talk to everybody. I don't care. You know, I, so it, I, I wasn't myself. I, I really, as a young, young child, even before I started to read and write, I knew there was something different. I didn't fit in. And, uh, starting to read and write, of course, you know, I, I you know, I was looking into the playground, kids playing, and I was sitting in, in front of a, of the um, school uh, uh, board, it's called, uh, with, you know, extra education, and I didn't understand <laughs> what they were talking about. Um, yeah, my, I, I felt, I really felt stupid, and I really wondered what would, I'd be doing in life later. So I thought, I'm, I'm going to be a mom. At least I can be a mom, you know? So if people would ask me, what do you want to do later in life? I said, a mother. And I thought, no career for me. It's Forget it. <laughs> um, after school, I started to work and I, I realized, ah, this is a place that I can do better in. I know how to connect with people. I'm... Um, I do, as as Mark said, I do see this bigger picture, and I could be sharp on on strategies, and and I understood how to guide people, and I, so I was working in the creative industry, uh, graphic design industry, and I encountered many dyslexics, because mm. many of these kids are dyslexic. So. I didn't do the creative part. I did the project management part, which is talking, guiding, uh, everything that I was good at. And so I, I started to kind of feel uh, a little bit worth a while. Like, you know, um, although I always said to myself, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm, I, I guess I'm just lucky. You know, so it, it wasn't still appreciating my skills is just lucky or or... You know, I'm, I'm just, uh, who's going to see that I, what I'm doing is, you know, has nothing to do with skills, just just doing it. And so a little bit of an imposter syndrome going on there. <laughs> very much, very much. Until even uh, uh, the last 10 years of my graphic uh, design career as a project manager and uh, operations director of the greatest design company in Holland, <clears throat> I still thought, you know, Guiding the whole company together with my uh, fantastic um, uh, creative director, I still felt like, you know, I'm just doing anything. I don't know. Somebody's going to come around and say, oh, <laughs> I looked right through it, you know. Uh, when I stopped uh, because of my kids and, and going, you know, in school going under, um, and started to realize, ah, wait, this disability isn't just, the disability, it is skills and these skills, reading the book, Dyslexic Advantage called uh, uh, Dyslexia Oscons in Dutch. Oh, I, I, all these things came together and I realized this is my brain doing it. It's not just luck, you know, it's just not just doing life. Uh, no, it's because I'm good at it. And that was like 43 I was. I think that I yeah, started. I'm a, I'm a strength based coach and I use it a lot in my coaching of neurodiverse pe people, neurodivergent people. And it's such a thing that people are completely blind to their own strengths and they tend yeah. to downplay them. And especially if they have other aspects that have made sure that they are called upon what they're not good at all their life. Yeah. They tend to even more put it down to luck and and uh, just stumbling along and uh, yeah. they don't see what they're actually great at and what other people value them for and how they bring a lot of impact 
to whatever it is that they do. Yeah. And it's not just instinct. And I always explain it as instinct. It's not. It's a skill that you could use. And um, I do a lot of on feeling. So it's on my instincts. Um, um, but I, I know that I'm right. I know that I have the good idea. I know that I have to go that way. And it's just this very strong, like Mark said, you cannot put it into words. You just yeah. see it in front of you and it has no words. It's just, you know. This is the you know this is the way we have to go. One of the like I I feel like it's also it's like yeah I feel like it's sorry it's it's like uh you know the process that I that we do I feel like we know it's right like you're saying we know it's right we know we we have it it's there sometimes to achieve it is the hardest part but sometimes people can't understand the process or they 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 ridicule or they think like oh like this is I don't want to say weird, but like, you know, maybe they think like, I wouldn't do it like this or that's wrong. You know, this is the thing that I would get is like, you no, know, that, that process is wrong, but I'm like, no, it's right. Like we have to do it this way or I have to do it this way. And I hope I can explain it to you, you know? Yeah. yeah. Very, I can see that a lot. It's very hard, I think, to explain that because seeing, being able to see that process is a function of how your neurology is different. And that was one of the most eye-opening things I encountered in the, the book, The Dyslexic Advantage, is this explanation of how the brain structure is actually different and there are less connections between the various brain areas and inside the various brain areas in these stacks of neurons that we have. Mm -hmm. And there are way more connections in dyslexics between the various brain areas. So that you do see, you really have capability to see the bigger picture a whole lot better and differently than other people who are way more detail oriented because their brains have more connections between the neuron stacks and within a certain brain area rather than crossing throughout the brain. It would be so good if we have a knowledge about that on the work floor and in schools actually, but, uh, and then just, believing that we can be right and just try and dare to follow us. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky in the, in the company that I worked in, the creative director who was this ADHD, he doesn't think so, but I know he is, <laughs> um, guy uh, who had like millions of ideas and um, just throwing them at me. And I knew this one, no, this one, yes, this one, no, no, no. And I could just feel which one was working. And, and we had so much success in this company uh, just by him believing that I could pick the right one. Yeah, you really need either somebody to give you a chance or somebody to give you a lot of time so that over time you can prove that that intuitive thinking has a lot of merit and it actually will prove itself right over time. And, and, it's, it's, and it's, several of my friends who are in, in sort of areas where there's a lot of shortage right now, so they've been given a chance to prove that yeah. sort of intuitive thinking for three or four years, and now people around them are saying, oh, yeah, I thought you were like a bit of a bit insane for suggesting this, but you're always right. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I think it has to do with self-esteem also. Yeah. To create yourself this work floor and the workspace that you are saying, listen, I know I'm right. And to dare to speak out, that is a hard road to walk because, you know, we've been called crazy, like Mark is saying. But if you keep your self-esteem and you know that you're right and you, you've seen that before and, and again and again, just stay strong and speak it out and then stay, stay confident. I think that's the most important thing to have. Your yeah. Confidence. yeah, I think that also... Um... You know, there is this level of confidence that it, that you, you need to have with like, okay, trying to get the idea. I think honesty uh, to the people around you, this is, this is the, the next kind of element. It's like, okay, I have the confidence. I know that I, I have a good, uh, you know, head on my shoulders and, and, I'm, and I'm looking at this, I believe it's the right way. Then you have to also have the understanding from your team that like, okay, I think th I think differently, you know, and 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 I want to showcase this skill. Yeah. Again, you have to also be ready that it may not be perfect. 
Mm-hmm. And this and this uh, confidence and this uh, openness, but there also needs to be this element of, you know, I know that I have difficulty sometimes taking criticism. I know that in, in this industry, especially creative industry, you have to learn to take the criticism as, um, you know, constructive and something that you can work with and to not let it, you know, I, 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 I've been there too many times where I think I'm right and I think that I have the right direction, but they have a good point and taking that in and not being too hard on myself, um, but moving on, I think is, is one of, uh, if not the most important element that I've been trying to learn, you know, this endurance, I guess I, I've been, you know, t- calling it or having the thick skin and not taking things so so personally when you when you are not right, you know? But the thing is failing, failing is something that we do a lot in school. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, we've been told that through failing you learn, but we haven't got that experience, you true. know. It's true. You know, we got low grades after making many mistakes and we do our best and then still low grades and nobody's, um, yeah. if, you know, feeling that, that all these making mistakes is letting you grow because you're failing all the time. So I think as soon as we get criticism, we go into that old feeling of, you know, it has no point, I, you know, it's just this horrible feeling of failing. Um, and we've had it too many. It's like what Nicholson says, you know, it's this abscess in our brains. Uh, and I think if you go through school with more confidence and understanding that this failing that we do in school is logical, <laughs> you know, it's like, duh, I'm dyslexic. I'm supposed to make many mistakes and have no bad feeling in making mistakes and do feel like it's growing and I have to train my brain to do the best reading and writing that I can get out of me uh, without comparing to the rest, because that's no point. Mm-hmm. Um, then I hope that, and that's also knowledge about your brain that in later life, when you have, have encountered criticism, what we all have, we take it as uh, you're saying, like a, a process of, ah, do I do something with this criticism or are they right? And to get this, healthy way of dealing with it instead of yeah and it's yeah. a tornado in your head it's just like an, it, you you get stuck and i think this is where a lot mm-hmm. of the anxiety and the depression because we get stuck in this hole where we we can't stop thinking about something that doesn't even really matter sometimes yeah. you no know? mm-hmm. something that we should easily get over but i i love what you're saying how yeah it is a bit of this like you know, trauma from childhood, this failing in school and not, not having this progress. I love that. I haven't even thought about that, that kind of oh. direction. And this is why I always question why there's go red for dyslexia when red is associated with like bad marks. You know, I, I never really understood that. Um, so I'm just saying that, but uh, that's why I always like thought, you know, I don't want to see red marks. The red marks actually create this anxiety, you know, yeah. this, this yeah. trauma, uh, resurfacing surfacing this trauma. But anyways, I love that at, point. At the risk of then triggering the trauma a little bit, <laughs> I wanted to speak with you about this concept of rebranding. It's been uh, uh, an ongoing discussion, I think, in the wider neurodiversity movement as well. There's been proposals to rename ADHD, to get mm-hmm. rid of disorder in autism and in ADHD and how it's named. Uh, And on the surface, you might say, oh, how superficial this language policing, like, why does it matter? But knowing both of you, like, I know that you have deeply thought about how this connects to changing the experience for dyslexic kids and adults in the future. So tell me a little bit more about how you landed on the concept of rebranding and why it matters. Who do you want to... Start talking. Well, ah. Whoever feels like a starting first, why don't you, you go, go to okay. Well, it it felt it was like the first meeting with Stephanie, uh, my my uh, co-founder. Uh, she said, "You know, we're telling the half half of the story to these kids. This is crazy. We have to rebrand." And I went like, "What rebrand? I I did rebranding. Like I understand." 
And it connected so well in my brain because I thought if we are telling these kids, like I said before, it's logical that in school that is made for the bigger group that we, you know, we aren't made of, um, that we are failing and that we have these experiences in schools because of our difference in our brains. And, and everybody's bad at something and everybody's good at another thing. And so why aren't we telling the whole story? So for me, it was, if we are telling this whole story of dyslexia, the children will go through school in a different way. The teachers will approach these kids in a different way. Um, the, the kids around them will, do you know, and the parents, everybody will see it differently. And then after school, they grow into these self-conscious, great, strong people that can c contribute instead of being stuck you know and so uh it, for me it was completely logical to do it like an instinct again like this is the way to go uh of course with many bumps in the road uh and of non-believers <laughs> but on the other hand um every dyslexic person child or grown-up that we talk to about their strengths recognized some of them everybody mm -hmm. and so it strengthens my idea of going ahead because we are the voice of these kids and these parents and these dyslexics all over Holland and uh, all over the world. So I feel we need to tell the whole story to have this solution on all the troubles that the dyslexics have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I would say that we also need to teach those skills in school because they're valuable for everybody. And I've being a learning designer who started their career as a media scholar, uh, 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 analyzing stories in media. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the, the move that we've seen in the last 15 years to pay way more attention to visual media, storytelling, presentations, hmm. to teach people stuff and then help them sort of anchor that in their brain by processing it into a visual presentation and collaborating on that so that also people who don't have the best reading and writing skills can still showcase their talent for presenting information because writing doesn't always showcase information in the best way there are many other formats yeah. like yeah. storytelling like visual representations that allow you to process information and learn actually new elements that you might not learn through language. You know, I, I think what would be really, really in the future, the way to go for, for uh, learning to read and write and learning is to just ask the child, what do you need to learn? Do you need a quieter of surroundings? Do you need more time? Do you need a different approach? Do you much more because every time that I ask this this to the children, they know what they need. You know, they know, but nobody's asking. And so they 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 think it's they you know I'm not allowed and the group isn't doing it. So I'm I don't want to be different because it's negative to be different. I think to teach in school the the to to start to tell tell the story of what do you need and figure it out and go on this trip and in in this road trip and how how would you like to learn what's your way I think that would be something that so of course we can uh, teach children to have uh, more uh, ideas on storytelling I think that's twenty first century skills you know, schools have to wake up because we need these 21st It's It's like John Stein said, you know, uh, congratulations, your child is dyslexic. It's the brain of the, the future, you know. Um, but um, let's teach the children that we have all different brains that um, together work, work well, instead of we, we want everybody to have the same brain. And if you don't have the same brain, there's something wrong with you. We don't need that, you know, it's it's old thinking, like Mark says, we need the, the modern way of thinking, the more inclusive way, because it brings all of us many more successes and growth. Yeah, yeah. and it makes the world better for everybody. Yes. Mark, would you like to expand a little bit on why yeah, the concept I mean, of rebranding matters to you and why it's not superficial? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I love the the points. It it just was kind of um, getting right to the you know getting to the point where um, diversity, equality, inclusion is everywhere. You know, it's it's there's yes. so many businesses, so many companies that have these programs, but very very little include neurodiversity in these programs. Very very little. Um, and this whole idea about um, you know being uh, different is is bad. Now it's changing. That you know it, the younger generation, Gen Z, Millennial, and and now my kids, you know Gen A, um, they they are having different understandings of what normal is, and being abnormal and different is the trend. This is this is what is is progressing. This is the movement that it's taking. But it's the older generations that are not conforming or understanding the the depth of of being divergent, you know, the depth of it not only being the color of your skin or your race or your sexual orientation, but it's also about the brain. And yeah. there is a discrimination against the brain. Um, and and you know, when it comes to rebranding, uh, I think one of the reasons why I I love rebranding and why I saw a perfect opportunity to rebrand dyslexia um, is that I am a problem solver. I love to solve problems. You know, this is this is one of my greatest skills. You know, besides from the three the three D thinking and the problem solving go hand in hand because yeah. I I can lay it out and I can see where the problem is super easily and put it back up and I say this is it this is a problem and here's a possible solution because it you know it solves the problem, you know, to, to a degree. So um, with dyslexia, I saw there's a problem, you know, I saw a fun creative aspect of it that we can't spell dyslexia. So there's a, there's a problem right there, very visual problem. Um, but also, you know, uh, when you rebrand, it's usually because there is, you know, a, a problem with the company, you know, there are, for uh, perception, you know, that's one of the main ones. So the perception of dyslexia is not great. Um, you know, also there needs to be some, you know, it, as the times move on, as they change, why brands rebrand is because the trends change, the communication change, the channels change, the generations change. And you see with dyslexia, there hasn't been a lot of change. There's been a lot of piling this is what i see a lot of piling a lot of the same conversation a lot of the same approach millions of or not millions hundreds seems like millions hundreds of organizations and everybody trying to do the same thing with the same mission um but everyone's doing it on their own way and there's you know all of this kind of like we're talking about this uh difficulty with uh failure and com competition or someone's going to steal something there's a lot of this going on so i see these are a lot of problems that need a solution you know and what better thing to do is to rebrand to 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 take that that little thing like we can't spell it or it's outdated people think they know what it is let's change that let's flip it upside down you know we shorten everything for modern appeal today everything so why not this you know and again every i feel like the the community we all want we're all creative minds we all have a million ideas we have a million businesses that we want to make um we just don't know how to achieve it or maybe we don't have that confidence or that collection as a community to to achieve it together and i think that this this was one element where it's like okay so we have the problem, which we rebrand. Let's, you know, change the name. Let's flip it upside down. Let's do something different, um, atypical kind of approach. Um, but also let's bring the, the, the problem of us being separated, but having the same mission, let's bring us together. You know, let's, let's work on things together and collaborate together and share our ideas and our thoughts and not be afraid, you know, to open up and, and to showcase that. And, so a part of rebranding is also changing identity, you know, it's an identity change. And I, and I, I put that on myself as well. You know, it's like, I want to change the identity and the narrative so that I can be open about it and not be afraid about it. And hopefully that rebranding of my identity as a dyslexic 
will help to change the behavior of the audience, which is the whole point, you know, to get their behavior change, their awareness, their new perceptions, their inspiration. And hopefully that will shift the paradigm so that when, you know, people are faced with neurodiversity, a neurodivergent person or a dyslexic person um, that maybe isn't open about it, they can recognize the signs, they can see the importance of that, and there can be some progress so that um, finally our kids who are, you know, could be or are neurodivergent have a better experience and a better transition into the working world. I love it. I love how you're, again, seeing the big picture and connecting the dots on a couple of like really influential areas around this, because the stigma, in part, it's not true. But of course, in part, it connects to the things that are, in fact, difficult about having dyslexia in a world where reading and writing is seen as such an important fundamental skill that is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you're also saying like, but this leaves out part of the picture. If we only focus on what people can't do with a certain brain type, then we're leaving out what they actually can do because of their brain type. Uh, and that can be really fundamental to, to changing things in the world for the better. And by, by sort of lifting or lightening or correcting the stigma into a more complete picture, we are also allowing people to step out, own their dyslexia, which means they get to be open, they get to be seen by other dyslexics, then we can connect, we can collaborate, we can work on how to actually tap into the dyslexic strengths and make sure that also employers know about these, they'll hire people if they're looking for those types of strengths and they'll be willing to accommodate them in the workplace. And they'll be willing to invest in better communication between different neurotypes in the workplace yeah. because they know if we all work together, we get an even more complete picture of reality, which means we're better at problem solving. Yeah, exactly. Because we also need those detail-oriented people who like put all yeah. of the dots on the eyes and correct the spelling errors uh, uh, sure. to make the thing perfect. Yeah. I think that's that's a, a thing when we started, and we like made by dyslexia is is very much out out there going. You know, we're extraordinary and it's fantastic, and it isn't always fantastic. It's some sometimes really really irritatingly shit to be dyslexic, right? In a, in a in a in a in the world that that uh, isn't um, much of the time dyslexic. So. Um, I think to put us above others is not my idea of of um, changing our view on labels. Um, I think it's really like you're saying, Saskia. It's about co completing the whole. Everybody ha having the feeling that they're worthwhile. There's something that they're there and they're good at, and this brain is on this earth for something mm -hmm. and um and everybody's brain is um so i think that's really fantastic mark what you're doing and uh it's interesting because um i have uh, since a month uh, a, a youth board a children's board in the company in the in the uh, foundation which is interesting and that's what they said why is this such a difficult word you know this is crazy we have to change the word and I'm, of course, I'm saying, well, there's, uh, you know, we have this different word and maybe we should have a look into it. Um, on the other hand, I'm thinking we've been working 30 years in Holland to get this on the table, this word, um, to, to get help. And we need these help, this help, right? So if we leave that behind, I've, I'm, I'm fearful because then the help isn't there in schools uh, if we change the, the, and I know we have to change the narrative, but is it also the word, which is very interesting uh, to think about. As I said to the children, okay, the, one idea is to change the word. Another idea is that we know how to write this and the rest of the world doesn't. <laughs> it's our kind of secret, secret name that nobody else can just write uh, the right way only the dyslexic can because we have to write it all the time so maybe that's the joke you know um so they found it funny as well to to then you know 
train to get this word right. Yeah. It's yeah. a really interesting point and something I've run into with ADHD as well. Like you don't want to rename Coca-Cola <laughs> yeah. because you yeah. lose like all of the recognition that that comes with in people's brains. Uh, and yeah. at the same time, you want to maybe get rid of um, the things that are not nice, like, for instance, dropping disorder from the ADHD uh, yeah. uh, letters. So yeah, I think I think with the official language and, and, you know, with the word itself, it always will be there. It is it is very much a part of, you know, I mean, everything has a, a history or baseline with the language and dyslexia and neurodiversity. All of that is is very much. But I think that. It's about moderning, uh, making a modern communication that like, it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, the official change like in the dictionary, but the dictionary also adds different ways of, of expressing certain words and certain things. Um, and I feel what, I think one reason why um, I'm trying a name change or at least, you know, a, a part of that is to see um, and I have seen how people are like, well, what is Lex? Like, they don't already are like, oh, dyslexia, boom. I instantly am thinking about all the uh, the stereotypical outdated things that I remember of it. Like, oh, you you can't read and you, you know, you spell backwards, which is what I hear. Mm -hmm. But with Lex, it's like, you know, well, I get into... I get into a way of explaining to them. And and it, I think it it can resonate with um boosting the confidence for the younger for the younger generation because it's making it kind of cool you know it's bringing a cool element to it you know um it's not rewriting history but it is being progressive and and moving the the narrative to a more modern um language which is what a lot of these kids um relate to and can yeah. understand um but and and you know to 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 the fact of the word neurodiversity, I think it's a very scary word for businesses. Like it is a frightening word. They don't know what it is. They think this is going to cost us so much money. This is going to affect the uh, productivity of the team. You know what does this person mean in neurodiversity? Oh, Tourette's, autism. Oh my God, what is that? You know, can we have an autistic person? This is the narratives I get with when I talk to people who know nothing about neurodiversity don't even know what the word is and their first instinct is like whoa that's scary yeah. so how do we make it not scary you know how how can we not you know be changing anything but changing the communication around it yeah. so that brings me to my closing question on the topic of rebranding is that a big part of rebranding is of course also creating a slogan or a catchphrase so how would you, and we don't have to land on the definitive answer here. I just like to be a little like in a brainstorming spitballing phase with you a little. If you would have to write a slogan or a catchphrase for what is your mission or your call to action around this for you personally, how would you phrase it? Mark, you go. <laughs> I have to do it in Dutch and then in English and oh my God. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I, we have one that we use a lot. This, uh, you know, we, we are the, um, we are the community that fights for acceptance. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a little bit different than, uh, I mean, if you were to elaborate it on more, you know, it, it's about, um, you know, we we have the opportunity to shift the paradigm around neurodiversity. You know, th I think this is kind of the direction that I've been thinking and taking it is this idea of shifting, you know, like that we can shift it together. So shifting neurodiversity together. I don't know, something like okay, that. Okay, nice. I like it. <laughs> Tamara, like I said, there's no pressure to come up with the perfect slogan or call to action right now, but I just want to see some of that creativity yeah. in action. Um, yeah, like, well, I think the most important thing is tell the whole story of dyslexia. So, yeah. you know, people, you have this label discussion, should we label or not? I feel that for now, yes, you know, in this situation that we are in now, uh, yes, we should label, but we shouldn't label negative. We should label telling the whole story. So if somebody gets a label, it's 
things that they have trouble with and they are good at, you know, it's this whole story. So let's tell the whole story of neurodiversity or labels or dyslexia. Yeah. I think uh, every time we talk about that with different people from science to, to business people to children, everybody understands. Everybody understands that you're good at one thing and not good in the other because everybody has that thing, you know? Yeah. And so, so I think it's quite easy in these conversations. They get this point. Yeah. And I think what a dyslexic brain might bring to that is like in Dutch, we have the expression like both sides of the metal. And I think in English, you say both sides of the coin, mm -hmm. that they are two sides of the same coin. You yeah. are amazing at some skills because you have the brain structure for it, which means you are less amazing at certain other skills. Yeah. And yeah, they belong together. And yes. we should yeah. definitely shine a light on both sides of the coin and not just on the side that has been in the spotlight so far. Uh, Which about. is great. I, I, that's something I want to express. It's been really good that the last 30 years we've been focusing on on uh, our, our challenges because uh, there's help, there are methods to help us to get to read and write, there are, there are tools, that's great. I don't think that's uh, like waste of time. It's just time for the next phase to, to also focus on uh, the, the, the great things in these minds. Yeah, and I think if once you know how the strengths are connected to the downsides, you can even leverage your strengths sure. to yep. make sure that whatever you have to train very hard to get slightly better at just to get along in society. Once you can tap into your strengths while you do that, it becomes so much easier. I always say like strengths are the highways in our brain. And yeah. if we can build on and off ramps for the skills that are difficult to those strengths pathways, then learning becomes so much easier. But it, it, it's, it's, we have this problem solving brain. Let's solve our own problems. You know, yeah, that's, that's the hard part is solving our own problems. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so let's yeah. not solve them on our own. Let's yeah. solve them together because yeah. I think uh, uh, that is maybe the main reason that I am enthusiastic about the idea of neurodiversity is that neurodiversity is everybody. So yeah. if we could just be open about how diverse brains are, yeah. we can support each other. Yeah. That's it. So um, finally, I would like to give you to the opportunity to sort of showcase if people want to learn more about your work, potentially might want to collaborate with you. Where do they go to find you? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so. After I came, uh, after I opened up and, and did the TEDx last year, the TEDx is um, TEDx UNYP, and the title is uh, Rebranding Dyslexia, I Am Lex. So you can find that on YouTube. Um, I also created a website. Um, it's www.im-lex.com. Uh, and we have a lot of resource resources there. You can get in, in contact with us. You know, I, at this moment, we're trying to just link up and connect with as many creative thinkers and, and people. And uh, the hope is to really create a, a nice channel for the modern communication around dyslexia. And so, yeah, we would, you know, at this moment, it's just about, I, I will talk with anybody, you know, if, if it has to do with, you know, getting down to the real uh, aspects of around dyslexia and creativity, or if it is needing help with campaigns or, um, anything that is related to my specialty, you know, I'm, I'm always open and you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. So I appreciate the chance to come here and, and talk. And I, I love this discussion. I think it's so important. Thank you so much for sharing. Tamara, how about you? Where can people find you? So the the um, URL is um, hoi, which is you can see it in my three-dimensional logo. <laughs> uh, um, um, slash, no, no, it's the little, you know. Dash. Dash. Uh, foundation.nl. Um, and we are focused 
like 80% on education. So we have master classes for schools, but we have master classes for businesses as well. We have, uh, I do myself the children coaching um, purely on the strength based side of things to, to, to discover your strengths and put them into practice and, and let your, your self esteem grow. Um, we have the week of dyslexia brought into Holland uh, since a few years, and this year it's going to be huge. We have six different things in the first uh, week of October to go to, to uh, have uh, free webinars uh, to the see. Sixth edition this year, right? Yes, I think so. You're right. Yeah. Wow. I yeah, uh, and um, for the kids, which is the most fun to do, is um, uh, the Happy Dyslexic Festival. Um, last year, there were 324 kids and parents there, and uh, it's so much fun because they suddenly connect together, look around, and see that, you know, they're not alone. There are many of us, <laughs> and, um, and just try to discover their strengths and give them a self-esteem boost. So... Week of dyslexia.nl of week van dyslexie.nl and um, what else? Yeah, we I might want to showcase your co-founder Stephanie Raber, who I was presenting with as at an event uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, me covering ADHD, her covering dyslexia, who is yes. also a partner in the new neurodiversity in business and uh, the Netherlands initiative. So uh, also, if you're looking for a speaker on a more adult or for a workplace, she would be an amazing person to approach, I think. For sure. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I'm really looking forward. Um, this talk will be published during our two-day emergence event, and it will be available afterwards for replay for whomever has been signed up to that event or later signs up for uh, the replay on our website, Neurodiversity Education Academy. And um, well, again, I want to express my gratitude for uh, you two for doing this with me, but also for all the work that you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.